Welcome everyone to Coaching in Session. My name is Michael Reardon and I'll be your mindset coach today. And today we're going to be talking about mindset. My favorite thing, my favorite subject, just a calling of why I'm here with Coaching in Session and what I do with Reardon Concepts. Because mindset is going to be what makes us do what we have to do. How can we be the best person possible? How can we be more than we were the day before? It starts with your mindset. And if you don't have a good mindset, what do we do? We can change it. But oftentimes many people don't know where to begin, how to change your mindset. What needs to be done in order for that mindset to change? And I have great news for you today because we're going to be bringing on another mindset coach, Mio Santana, who's going to be helping us with the work she does as a self-love mindset coach, talking about her journey, talking about what it takes to be a mindset coach. How can a mindset coach help you? Because if we can understand what a mindset coach can do and we start to apply their words of wisdom, their bits of knowledge, then we can become better in our own rights in our own life. You just have to know what to do from there. Oftentimes, we think we know what's best, but in reality, we are just kind of going through life with this trial and error process, and we don't have to have trial and error in every aspect of our life. We can sometimes take the path that is going to be already treaded by someone, and oftentimes when you're a coach, life coach, mindset coach, or relationship coach, you are going to be into that mindset of what it's going to take for someone to get to that place, right? So they're in that teacher role. And they're helping you, guide you, see what changes need to happen in your life. Well, if there are any changes that need to happen, we're going to see them first. Because sometimes when we look at our own life, we might not see the blind spots. We might not see the problems. And it's important for us to see what's happening. And sometimes we have to do it through someone else's eyes. So let's get into that interview with Mio and myself and start to look through someone else's eyes. Welcome, Mia Santana, the Coaching in Session. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you, Michael. Thank you so much for coming in today. I have you on as a self-love mindset coach. And if you know anything about me, mindset is close to my heart. I'm going to kind of let you give yourself an introduction to mindset because it's always different when I talk to other mindset coaches where we do a little extra. If you can, in your own words, tell the world what you do and how you help. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me also. Well, mindset is everything, Michael. What we don't realize in our society is we're trained and programmed to be victims of our circumstances through everything that we experience in life. And transforming myself and going through my own journey, I was able to realize and learn that I'm the creator of my reality versus the victim of my circumstances. And that all stems from one thing, and it's mindset. Choose to be your own worst enemy, or you could choose to be your own best friend. And you get to make that choice every single day, every single moment of every single day of your life. And the reason I became a mindset coach is because of my own journey. It took me over 20 years to find myself and to learn how to love myself. I used to hate myself. I used to loathe myself. I used to have anxiety, depression, undiagnosed depression, but still. And I was suffering inside silently in misery for many, many years. And so I finally learned how to love myself. I finally learned how to put myself first, stop people pleasing, and figure out what was important to me and what I wanted to do in this world. And that led me to my own transformational journey and becoming certified as a transformational trainer. We have similar stories start to mindset because I didn't really get into my mindset until maybe my late teenage years or maybe even when I was like around 2021, where mindset for me was an awakening in the sense of me paying attention to what the world was doing. It was almost like a cause and effect. If I do this, this is what happens to my life. I was looking at how can I make everyone like me? versus I don't need anyone to like me. We get that a lot in high school where we have our peer groups and our friends and we want everyone to like us. And at the time, I believe my space was a thing and we had to make sure like our top 15 or 20 friends. And if you ever got mad at someone, you would take them away and you would only have a cup of milk. And that would start so many arguments. Why am I not on your top 10 or whatever it'd be? Where we were always looking for that validation When we are looking for that validation, a few things happen. We lose our self-identity because we are becoming someone that is not our true selves, but rather we're becoming someone that fits in with what someone else might want. So we're looking at someone else's ideal for themselves and saying, well, I can fit in that role. Please love me. 
Why do you think so many people fall into that mindset of people pleasing? Well, because Michael, we're communal creatures at heart. Through evolution, we learned through evolve through the community, through, through the tribe. So we're used to finding cues within those around us to understand our own movements, our own behaviors, what's accepted, what's not accepted. Back in tribal days, if you went against what was part of the community, you were outcasted and shunned away into by yourself. And usually someone that would be cast away would probably end up dying because they didn't have the resources to survive. And so we're very innately programmed to want to fit in, to want to assimilate and be like others around us. The thing is that we end up losing ourselves in the process. And I do a lot of work with clients who are interested in, in self-love. And a lot of them come from families with siblings, with you know larger families, and where either you're the, the oldest child, the middle child, or the youngest you're going to have a separate set of issues that led to you losing yourself within that process and not knowing what your identity is. I mean, for many years, I didn't even know what my favorite color was. I was just like, whatever they like, you know, whatever my friends like. And it's a very miserable way to live. But when you're in that cloud, per se, you don't realize it until it starts becoming uncomfortable enough that you're like, wait, there's something. I always used to ask myself, I used to say, there has to be something more. Life can't just be like this. Like, there has to be something more for me. I can't just be people's doormat all the time and just do what everybody else wants. Like, what do I want? Everyone has their own individual journey to getting there. But yeah, that's definitely, I think, one of the reasons why we seek to be like others. And was English your first or second language? Well, actually, English was my second language. I learned Spanish, Cuban family, Cuban American, and I learned Spanish from the ages of one to five. And then when I started kindergarten is when I started English. And then I never, I never went back. I would speak English to my mother and she would speak Spanish back to me. And that's how we communicated. I find this often quite true with like ESL learners who are learning English as a second language. I was a teacher for many years and I saw students who would come in who wouldn't know a lick of English. They just know Spanish and you would have to speak to them in Spanish. What they did was they just mimicked the other students. They would conform to everyone. When you said that you didn't know your favorite color, I was like, oh, you know, English must be her second language, which it was. So that makes perfect sense because oftentimes when someone is trying to fit in the best they can and they don't speak the same language, they mimic the actions. What they do is they will dress the same. They will like the same things. Oh, you like trucks? So I guess I like trucks too, right? Because the culture is different too. And right now we're living in a culture of people who like to follow trends. What's the latest trend on TikTok? Or what's the latest trend on Instagram or Twitter? Oh, I need this outfit because this is what all the celebrities are wearing. So we follow people quickly. What does that do to our mindset when we're always following the next trend rather than creating our own trend? Image dysmorphia and body dysmorphia is huge. And I come across a lot of clients in self-love that are dealing with a lot of body shame issues, a lot of body image issues especially with women, but it happens with men too. You know, men are not excluded from that. We get this image through media that what the perfect look, the, the perfect beach body, perfect bikini body, as though my body is not perfect as it is in a bikini because I have a body and I'm in a bikini. So it's a bikini body, but we don't treat it that way. We look at this ideal. And what we don't realize is that part of this animal kingdom, right? But we treat ourselves separate. In the animal kingdom, if you look around, you see all the different animals. You'll see lions and tigers and, and monkeys and giraffes and everybody is a different size. There's small monkeys, medium monkeys, large monkeys. There's small elephants, medium elephants, large elephants. The fish, you look at the fish, there's different sized fish for, for every different occasion. I mean, the variety is just endless. But then when it comes to the, the human being, we all have to be the same. We all have to be the same size, the same look, the same skin color. How is that even possible? There's no diversity there. There's no thriving in that type of environment if everyone's the same. The beauty in each of us is that we're unique. That's the beauty. And beauty is within the eye of the beholder. So there really is no definition of beauty except for what one finds beautiful. And so we're able to allow ourselves to be ourselves and to be unique. There's so much beauty that comes out of that. There's so much art and expression that comes out of that, that we're missing out on because of mass media. Very true. And when we look at the definition of self-love, we might be given a I guess you can say the mainstream media of what self-love is. Oh, you are beautiful just the way you are. Though that is true in a sense, we do have to understand if we're happy truly with ourselves when we look at ourselves in a mirror. And I think sometimes people, they lie to themselves because it's easier to lie than to take action. If I can, what is your definition of self-love 
And then going on beyond that, how do you help people find that self-love in their life? Interesting is a lot of people come to me thinking that self-care is self-love. And self-care can only get you so far. It's good. Don't get me wrong. I'm not knocking self-care. I think it's great to have those practices to take care of your body, to give yourself what you need. But self-love goes deeper than that. For me, whenever I try to describe what self-love is, I call it a practice. Self-love is really a practice. Practicing how to love yourself. It's like getting to know yourself. You know, when you're dating someone, you get to know them, right? Before you fall in love with them. Because you want to know what their behaviors are, what their values are, what their principles are. And the more you learn about them, the more you fall deeply in love with them. You kind of have to do the same thing with yourself. You have to find those things that are so great about yourself that you think are so amazing that you start to develop this deep fountain of love within yourself. And this fountain runs really deep. And then what's cool about the fountain is that it never runs out. And so once you're able to tap into that fountain, there's nothing that anyone or anybody can do or say that'll shake your foundation because you'll be generating that love from within yourself, if that makes sense. And how do you help people get to that self-love? I developed a program. It's called Resilience. And I designed it from everything that it took me, everything that I learned in my journey, all the modalities that I took on, that I implemented, all the things that I learned, and I put them into this program. I believe that self-love is something you have to approach spiritually, emotionally, mentally, and physically through all aspects of your life. It's not a one-fits-all kind of thing. And it's not something that you can just do in one day. It takes time to really go deep and figure out what's blocking you from loving yourself. I work a lot with the inner child as well, because I believe that everything that happens to you from the ages of zero to seven and even up to the age of 12 becomes a pattern that you keep replaying in your life. First, we work on figuring out what those patterns are, what are the beliefs that you created as a child, and then we heal those. And so I have a four-pronged approach where we acknowledge, address, heal, and transform. And we do that all within the context of the resilience program. And we have several activities and rituals and ceremonies that we do. It's just a really robust and holistic program that I'm really proud of. The process of unwinding everything that we have done in our life, I think sometimes people have a hard time with that concept. Sometimes they have to unravel all of those knots that they have before they can comb through their life and make it straight. It's hard work because a lot of people, when they're going through it, they're going through those emotions and maybe those emotions are not necessarily the best to feel. Maybe they're not happiness and appreciation and admiration, but they're maybe anger and depression and sadness. So you have to go through that. And it's a very scary thing for people because they don't know what the other side is going to be. They don't know if they're going to feel better at the end of it. Sometimes people, they lose hope in their life and they just accept their circumstances and they don't want anything more. There's so many people in the world who just accept or have accepted their life of complacency. Though that is a good place to be if you don't want much in your life, many people do want more in their life. Many people want to be happy. They want to feel loved and appreciated, but they choose whether it be because of blocking their mindset or they give themselves this idea that happiness or a good mindset is not allotted for them. So what I do with many people is we have to figure out where they are in their life. Because if we don't know where you are, how can we figure out where you want to be? Because it's important to look at your journey because your journey is going to be unique. One client is might have the same situations as someone else, but their place is going to be different because the way we perceive things, our childhood, as you said, our environment might be different. And we have to allow for room and space to move. And sometimes we have to create that space. When you're creating that space for your clients, what are some ways you do it? I know for me, I make sure that I can get rid of as much stuff on their plate as possible. So we look at their schedule and we say, well, what's not important? What can we get rid of so we can make space for something better? What are ways that you help your clients make space? That's a great question. And something that you said made me think about the fact that most of us out there are just merely surviving. We're in survival. In order for you to survive, you need to keep yourself safe from the things that are a threat to you or that make you feel uncomfortable. We got really good at surviving when we were little, when things happened that we weren't clear about, that we were afraid of. We understood how to protect ourselves from that and how to survive it and continue living. So we got really good at that survival. But it doesn't mean that it's comfortable. It doesn't mean that it feels good. But when you're now an adult and you're faced with like changing and being able to transform it, you're like, no, wait, this is a tool. Like this is something that this is a skill that I developed. I know how to survive. I know how to how to maintain myself. It's self-preservation, if you will. But the thing that a lot of my clients realize is that the self-preservation is just preserving 
the uncomfortability of the experiences that you had and the patterns that you keep replaying. It's like your brain wants to stay in a, an uncomfortable situation that is known versus stepping into the unknown and possibly maybe experiencing discomfort. But the thing is that you may experience discomfort in the beginning just because you're shifting your practices in your routine. But eventually, most of my clients, they finally are able to find freedom because that survival is like an, a self-imposed prison that we put ourselves in. But it's not to ourselves. It's just the way that we were able to grow and survive and live. It was actually a good thing when we needed it. But now we get to say, okay, thank you. It's a survival mechanism for keeping me safe. But now I get to grow and expand into something else. I make it really simple. And the way I coach my clients is, listen, I don't have a secret formula. You know, I don't have a blue pill or red pill to give you that'll take all your problems away. But I can tell you this, I can guide you with what the, the tools that I have implemented in my life to transform my own life. And if you're willing to do the work, if you're willing to really step up and transform, I guarantee that you will have a breakthrough because it doesn't matter what the coach can do for you. The coach can't really do anything for you. The coach can only guide you to see your best self, for you to see the things inside you that you're not seeing because maybe you have a blind spot that you're not aware of. It really is about inviting them to step up to the plate and really give it their all so that they could get the results that they want. Very true. You said it. We are facilitators. We are there to help guide you and to see your blind spots. And I think sometimes people think they can see everything. You know everything. You don't need someone to help guide you. But then if you're really serious about your goals, you have to get serious about your actions. Sometimes inaction is what we do. Oh, you know, I had such a stressful day at work. My nine to five was so stressful. I just have to go home and eat some ice cream and get some fast food and sit on the sofa and watch some office. That's what I need right now because it's going to make me feel better. The self-care. The self we're all guilty so of it, right? <laughs> <laughs> that is so important. For me, I do have rules when it comes to TV. I'm not allowed to have the TV on Monday through Thursday. I can have the TV on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Work days for me are Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, mandatory work days. I'm going to do some work. All the other pleasurable stuff are going to be on my flex days on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So I'm very strict with my schedule, but that strictness doesn't mean that I have a bad life. This is how I choose to live my life. And you can choose any path you want. If you want to have more free time, figure out how you can have more free time. If you want to have more TV time, figure out where you can make more room for that TV time. I think sometimes we do things unconsciously, though, where we put ourselves in front of the TV but what's the purpose of it? What are you gaining from it? I think sometimes people, they don't understand what they're going to gain from making a shift or changing their life. And in my life, I made several mindset shifts from when I was in high school all the way up to today, where I know in a couple of years, I'll probably do another mindset shift. But those mindset shifts that I do, is always an evolution of my mindset. So where I was, it was one level. And then the next mindset shift is a different level. So when I'm working with clients, I do have to figure out where they are because if they're on that first level and I'm on the fifth level, I can't give them the advice that is of a fifth level because then they're going to be like, okay, this is great and all, but my mind is not ready for it. And it's similar to how we can be fit and in shape. You might be the best swimmer in the world, but if you have to do a triathlon, you might not be able to do it because you're not good at running or you might not even know how to ride a bike. We know one good aspect, but then there's other things that we have to learn. So we have to condition ourselves to handle any type of race or situation we're going to be in. We just can't jump head first and wish and hope for the best. That would be nice. I wish and tell many people, hey, you know what? Just you know, put all your money on black and just bet your luck away, right? It's not so simple. We do have to be cognizant of what we're doing, our actions and being deliberate. When we are looking at that deliberateness, basically, of someone taking more action, applying more self-love in their life, there has to be some direction that they have in their mind. When you were going on that self-love journey, what was that direction for you? When you were like, I want to fill my life with self-love, I want to get a good mindset, what was that direction like for you? Well, Einstein said, and I'm probably going to ruin this quote, but he, he said, the same mind that created the problem is not the same mind that's going to create the solution for it. I caught on very early on that I kept seeing the same patterns happening again and again and again in my life. And I became aware of the patterns, but I had no idea how to stop the pattern. 
and I would try, I would attempt, I would be like, okay, next time it ain't going to happen. I got this. I'm going to change. I'm going to be a better person. I'm going to change my choices. I'm going to do this and do that. And then it would happen again. I caught on to the fact that I didn't know how to solve the problem. and I needed to get guidance. I needed to find mentorship and guidance. And that's why coaches are so important, you know, because a coach, like we were saying earlier, doesn't have all the answers. A coach is just guiding you through your blind spots. That was one of the biggest things for me was realizing that I don't have the, the answers that I need, that I need to seek outside help. And that was one of the biggest shifts that I ever had. And once I did that, I never looked back. Even now to this day, as a transformational trainer, as a coach, I have my mentor and my teachers and my coaches that I look up to and that I work with and that keep challenging me and keep helping me shift my own mindsets, as you said earlier. But I have a funny story about discipline. And it's funny because I tell my clients, discipline is freedom. And they're like, what? How is that possible? But I see how you're implementing it in your life. And I have a funny story about a client recently who, because intention is everything, right? This is what I believe. Intention is everything in your life, how you want to create it. Her intention was that she wanted to have a better night routine so that she could wake up earlier and, you know, be more effective at her job with her family and be more pr productive and perform better. And so we were, you know, analyzing her night routine and I was giving her some suggestions and one week went by and then she would come back and she would say, oh, you know, I just didn't do the suggestions. I just didn't do this. I didn't do that. I wanted to. I didn't do it. But now, and now I feel bad about it. I was like, oh, interesting. OK. So then the next week came and I gave her a set of activities. I said, gave her one activity. I said, OK, this week you're not going to focus on your night routine. You're going to do those things that you were distracting yourself with before, like getting on social media and having fun and, you know, watching TV or whatever. Do that. Focus on that. That's your activity for the week. She was like, really? And I was like, yeah, do it. So what's funny, Michael, is that this little, you know, exploration led us to realize that she came back to the next call and she said, you know what, Neil, I actually focused more on my nighttime routine. And I was actually more, more productive in my routine when I gave myself the permission to be flexible and to be free and to, and to do what I wanted. I realized that that's not what I want to do. I want to do my night routine. And I started doing my night routine more. Sometimes it's psychology. We feel like we're limited. If we feel like we're missing out on something, the majority of us will try to rebel against that. There's this like inner dynamic going on where part of you wants to do the right thing. Part of you knows that you need to get to bed by 9 p.m. But the other one wants to stay up and see watch Game of Thrones, you know, or whatever. It's really starting to really know yourself and to really know the little the tricks that you could do on yourself. And really by doing that, she found the flexibility. She found like a release of pressure and of self-judgment. And she was able to actually start focusing on her night routine on her own in an empowered state. And then from there, we were able to shift the paradigm and she's been a lot better ever since doing what she wants to do. So just goes to show. I have a concept and I know many mindset coaches hold this concept too of planting the seed where we plant the seed and we know with attention awareness is really the key that that seed is going to sprout. Where as long as you know it's there, eventually it's going to pop up in your life. And that's what happened to your client there. She had the awareness of what she should be doing and the awareness of what she was doing. When you said, you know what, just do your social media stuff. She had that awareness there. It's like, well, you know, Mia told me to do this. Well, you know, at reverse psychology, I'm going to do the opposite. And so she did it, but she had to have that awareness first, because if you just told her to do the social media stuff, guess what she would have did the first time? She would have did the social media stuff and she would have came back and been very proud. Mia, I want to let you know I accomplished my task. And you're like, great, perfect. Then the second week, you would have said, okay, now here, let's, you know, let's have some awareness and let's create some awareness for your nighttime routine. The third week would have came and she would have said, Neo, I'm sorry, I, I don't know what happened, but I didn't get anything done. I was on my social media again. So the fact that we created that awareness first and then allowed her to have some breathing room and to show her that, you know what, we don't have to force this right now because sometimes things can take time similar to how you put a seed into the ground, you just can't look at it and hope it's going to sprout up the minute you plant it. Sometimes you have to water it. And that watering can be self-awareness. It could be self-love. It could be self-care, things like that, where we're paying attention. And sometimes those seeds can take years to sprout. I know Les Brown talks about this quite often with bamboo. It takes about 10 years, he said, for bamboo to grow. So you plant the seed of the bamboo you're looking at it and a year goes by, two years go by. I guess these are bad seeds, right? But 10 years down the road, guess what happens? You have these bamboo stalks. Did the seed take one day or 15 days to grow or did it take 10 years to grow, right? And I think sometimes people 
we only look at when it starts sprouting and when it goes up into the bamboo that we know versus the seed and the seed maturing in the ground. Sometimes our mind has to mature, similar to how men mature typically around 26 to 28. Women typically mature a lot earlier, around 20, 22 to 24. So that's when they are becoming more mature. Their mindset is becoming more mature. When I get a young guy, they're looking for answers, quick answers. And I just give them an awareness because I completely understand the idea of maturity and then the idea of the seed. Because I can give you all the answers, but you might not be ready for it yet. I give you what you need, give you the seeds that are going to eventually sprout out when it's time for it to sprout out. And then you're going to have that, oh, I remember that aha moment where you have that aha moment and everything becomes clear. There's almost in the sense of enlightenment when it comes to mindset, where we learn something and we're like, this makes perfect sense to me. I know I've had many experiences like that, where it's like almost eye-opening, jaw-dropping. You're just like, I can't believe I didn't know this sooner. Whether it be about money, with relationships, with career. And we learn and we go, I was doing it this way, but this way was going against or how I should have been going against it or going with it. That enlightenment is different, I think, for everyone. Because if we look at like Buddhism and they talk about enlightenment and they talk about spiritual awareness, it's different. And I know many people, they spend their whole life looking for enlightenment. Maybe sometimes they reach it, maybe sometimes they don't. But for me, enlightenment is not what the Buddhist monks are thinking about, or they're looking for this one answer, the meaning for life. Enlightenment for me is creating that awareness, creating that mindset and understanding who you are, where you want to be, and then how are you doing on that journey? Because if you can be aware of how you're moving in life, then you can move more appropriately. What was your journey like, or what was your sense of enlightenment when it came to mindset? That's a really good question, because oftentimes we believe in, and I believe that in order to find enlightenment, I had to go somewhere else or do something else outside of myself to find it. We talk about, we see the Buddhist monks, they're, you know, in a monastery on the top of a mountain, like for years, and they're finding their own enlightenment. But, you know, in regular society, we don't have the luxury of taking that time off and, and doing that. So I'm, I'm a believer that enlightenment can happen now in your day to day life. And that's how I had to access it. And I did practice Buddhism for many years and was able to navigate through that and find a lot of benefits through that through those practices. I realized that in order to allow myself to become enlightened, the first thing that I needed was to have the intention was to have to be open in the transformational industry, we call it being coachable, being open and, and being able to allow yourself to learn something, allow yourself to see something that you probably didn't see before. Because our ego tells us that we have all the answers. And we've survived this long in this life, we've been able to accomplish several things. So that gives us, you know, more confidence in who we are and what we're able to, to accomplish. But if we're unhappy inside, if we're feeling discomfort and dis-ease inside, there's, those are big signs that are telling us that there's something more for you in store. I really do believe it's about having a seeking spirit. It's about being open. I just was relentless. There's a saying in Buddhism that, you know, never stop, never give up. And I never gave up. I just kept going forward and I would fall maybe five steps back, but then I would take two steps forward and fall three steps back and take three more steps forward. And every time I would fall, I would learn something from the lesson and then incorporate it, integrate it, and then keep moving forward. And also having compassion for myself, understanding that I don't have all the answers, that there's no way that I could have all the answers and, and giving myself room for that. And slowly but surely getting there, you know, yeah, sometimes the journey to enlightenment can take a very long time. But I tell my clients too, sometimes it can take a second. Sometimes it could take a, a moment in, in time. You just click your fingers and it happens. Because time is just an illusion. Time is a construct. Like there really is no such thing as time. But what really is important is your intention, is your heart there. And if your heart is there, you will find it. Going on what we just said there, and then going on what you said before, the value of a coach is so important. Even in my life, I had many mentors, cooperating teachers, coaches that helped me see my blind spots, to help me not make so many mistakes. Because we have two options in life to make the mistakes that other people have made, or we can learn from other people that wisdom. 
yeah, we don't have to have the trial and error that everyone else has. And oftentimes coaches, the reason why they become coaches is because they experience that trial and error. Similar to how you said you would take, you know, five steps back, two steps forward, three steps back, three steps forward. It's that trial and error that you're learning. But the things that you learned during that trial and error was that wisdom. So when you work with someone who's on that beginning stage of mindset and of that journey of finding themselves, you can say, hey, you're doing exactly what I did. Let me not make you take three steps back. You're going to take one step back with only, only now because you, you might want to learn similar to how a child, don't touch the stove, it's hot. Don't touch the stove, it's hot. Oh, I'm going to touch the stove. And the kid touches the stove, they get burned and they learn. Ouch, that does not feel good. Sometimes in our life, we do have to get burned, but it doesn't have to be a constant because once the brain understands, wait, I just did something that I wasn't supposed to, that I was told not to do. I did it still and I got hurt. Let me start to heed some more uh, warnings now, right? So now a client starts working with you. They do something maybe that you told them not to do. And then there's a repercussion for that. And they're like, hmm, that makes sense now. And then they become even better students. They become more coachable because of that process. That's why I love mindset. That's why I love the coaching process because we are helping people get to the life that they want quicker than if they just did it themselves. Absolutely. Absolutely. I say that all the time. I mean, I say that the journey that took me 20 years to figure out, you can figure it out in eight weeks. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because I did all the legwork. You know, I went through all that stuff in order to get to where I am. So I can help you get there a lot faster. And no matter what you've been through, whether it was good, bad, the ups, the downs, the circumstances, the falls, everything led you to be here right now. And there's a moment where you start realizing, oh, it was all meant to be. It all had to happen the way it happened for me to learn what I needed to learn and for me to be here right now. And there's, then there's a sense of gratitude that comes with that. There's a sense of appreciation that starts to come, no matter how hard, because I've had clients that have gone through a, a, a lot of hard things and I myself have gone through hard things. I'm not saying that that justifies those things, but I'm just saying that you start to develop an, a, a different type of appreciation towards those, those things. Because if it wasn't for those things, you wouldn't be who you are. Sometimes the easy road is not always the right road, but then we do have to appreciate the road that we're on too, because if you're looking at a mountain, for example, you can go through the mountain, around the mountain, or up and down the mountain. There is going to be people who say, you know what, I'm going to create a tunnel in this mountain so it can be easy to traverse. We can still choose to go the long route. We can go up and down the mountain. We can go around the mountain, or we can go through the tunnel. And just depends on where your mindset is. It depends on where you want to be in your life, right? Maybe you want to go for that journey. Maybe you want to go see the best views possible. So you want to go to the top. Maybe you want to go on the road less traveled. So you go around again, or maybe you just want to get to the next step and you go through the mountain that was already paved. And you have to figure that out because I think sometimes people, they think they have to make their own way. Sometimes if we do that, it sets us back some, but you're not making your own way in many different things. For example, did you invent the car that you're driving? Probably not. Did you create the grocery store that you buy at grocery stores? Probably not. So you are utilizing things that are beneficial to you. So we have to create that awareness of, is this helping me today? Is this helping me get to where I want to be a lot quicker? And I think the work that we do helps people get to the life that they want to a lot sooner than later. Absolutely. And you know what's funny about the mountain? Everyone has to traverse it. Everyone has to go through the mountain in life. The hero's journey, as they call it. It's the fall from grace, let's say. You know, everyone has to go through the, the valley of the shadow of death. It's just a process of life. It's like you get into the earth plane and your first assignment is, okay, now you're going to go through some hardship so that you can find yourself and realize what this life is about and learn something here. It's like the school of life. Everyone has to traverse the mountain now. Are you going to, what choices are you going to make? And what is it going to look like for you? That's up to you. It's unique for everyone. I liked our conversation today. It was very open. It was very pragmatic. It was very fresh. It wasn't like very stringent. It was almost like we knew each other, like going in. It's like, oh, we talked. This is the first time we're meeting everyone. Just to let everyone know. This is the first time. It was just a smooth flow of conversation. And I really enjoyed our conversation because it was real. And I think that's what a lot of people look for. They look for real conversations where it's not like, oh, we are trying to sell you something because coaching is not about selling you something or giving you a program. It's about helping you get to where you want to be. I know the work that you do, Mio, is helping people get to where they want to be, getting to a better life. And if I can from you, can you please share with us any last words and then please tell the audience how they can find you. Absolutely. Yeah. And thank you, Michael. This has been such a pleasure. 
my final words would be if you are hurting inside, if you're if you feel like you've been replaying the same patterns over and over again, if you feel like it's just it's never ending, you're miserable, you're unhappy, you're exhausted, burnt out. I'm here to tell you that there's a different way that you could do it. There's a different way. There's an option for you and you can get through it. It's just a matter of never giving up. Just never give up. Just keep going forward. And yeah, and hopefully you can find a mentor or a coach or maybe one of us that can support you on that journey and steward you on your way. But either way, just never give up. Keep on going for your dreams because they matter and you matter. And with that, I will let people know that you can reach me at meosantanacoaching.com. On IG, on Instagram, you can reach me at meo underscore Santana. That's S-A-N-T-A-N-A for anyone who wants to talk. And I'll put all those links in the description box below so people can easily follow you. They can check out your website, all of your content, and then they can begin that process of beginning that mindset journey because it is a journey. It is something that might be difficult in the beginning, but the end result is something beautiful. I do want to thank you for spending some time with us today, sharing your wisdom, sharing your mindset, and allowing the audience to create that space in their life and create awareness for their journey to come. I would like to thank my guest, Mio Santana, for coming on Coaching in Session. The conversation that we had today, I said it in an episode, and I'm going to say it again, it was just a smooth flow of conversation. It was almost like I didn't want the episode to end. Though our episodes are sometimes on the shorter side, we are still giving you value. We're giving you the best knowledge that we can give you into this episode because our podcasts are typically less than an hour. Sometimes it could be 30 minutes, sometimes 45 minutes around there. But the goal is to give you something that when you're listening to, you're like, I am glad I listened to that. And you might not be glad that you listened to an episode, especially if someone has a different viewpoint. You're not always going to agree with one of the coaches on coaching and session because they're going to have a different mindset than you do. But just because they have a different mindset doesn't necessarily mean your mindset is wrong or their mindset is wrong. They have a different unique mindset, just how you have a different unique mindset. And that's what coaching and session does. We bring on coaches with different mindsets because the coach that comes on today or tomorrow or next week, they might have a different mindset or they might have the same exact mindset that you do. And you might resonate with what that coach said. And you might say, wow, that coach said exactly what I think. Reach out to that coach because that coach is going to be able to help you. Because that means if you're thinking the same way as that coach and not so much in the same way of that coach is thinking positive and you're thinking negative, but you have similar past tendencies, that coach already passed where you are currently. So he or she is going to know the direction of where you should be going. So they're going to offer advice and it's not so much of, hey, this work for me is going to work for you too. It's that that experience saying, hey, this is how I started the fire. How would you like to start your fire? And we're going to give you different tools. We're going to give you magnifying glass. We're going to give you flint and steel. We're going to give you lighter. We're going to give you matches. We're going to give you two sticks and you can start rubbing them together and create some smoke and then hopefully create some fire. Whichever one you choose, that's up to you. But the goal is to fire. Where did we end up? We had fire. How we did that fire, that's unique. That's up to you. So yeah, you can choose the lighter. You can choose the two sticks. doesn't necessarily matter as long as you get the fire. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to start that fire with inside of you, inside your mind. And if we can get that fire burning, burning bright, imagine what you can do in your life. Imagine where you can be because you can finally light the way into the darkest areas of your mind and you can figure out what is there. Because oftentimes our minds are filled with trash, filled with junk that doesn't necessarily need to be there. So we take the time, we do the due diligence in making sure that what's in our mind is helpful, is going to be necessary for our growth and for our abundance. Don't be weighed down by things that you don't need or don't be caught up into the whole process of trying to change your mindset because someone else told you to. The journey of mindset is going to be up to you. You might have a great mindset today, but can it be better? You might have a mindset that needs some adjustment, but do you want to change it? And these are questions that you have to ask yourself because you might be perfectly content being complacent and there's nothing wrong with not changing your life. All I ask is, if you look in the mirror and you look at your life, are you satisfied with it? Because if you're going to be living a life that's filled with regret at the end of it, wouldn't it be wise to make some changes today so then that at the end of our life, we don't have those regrets? I believe so. But just because I believe so doesn't necessarily mean that you believe so. 
So you have to figure out what you want. If you want to make some changes in your life, I recommend a mindset coach because a mindset coach is going to be able to help you look at your mind, look at your life, and then begin to make those changes that you want to see. My name is Michael Reardon. I'm a mindset coach. If you have any questions, you can email me, coachingincession at gmail.com, and I will see everyone on the next episode of Coaching in Session. Until then, everyone, take care.